Welcome everyone to webinar three in uh, the Department of Primary Industries and Regional Development Financial Intelligence webinar series. Um, a reminder, I'm Doug Watson and I'll be facilitating uh, this webinar today. Uh, special welcome to Perry, Perry Dolling from uh, DPIRD, who is a subject matter expert in terms of farming and in particular sheep farming. And Perry's here to hold my hand and help me uh, if there are any specific sort of farming agronomy type issues, um, as my background is obviously more in the finance area. And, and just a reminder that that is our main finance of this, uh, our main focus of this series is on the financial and the numbers side of things. And whilst we will dip into some more operational type issues and key performance indicators, etc., today, and indeed in a maybe webinar four as well, we are trying to stick to the numbers and the figures. Um, if you are interested more in other aspects of farming, then there are other programs of our and indeed face-to-face uh, -face through DPIRD. There are some references in a slide at the end. Uh, if you want further information on any one of the particular aspects we talk about, then the first port of call is probably those references. They're all web-based, so you can click and um, and go to the page. A quick revision of where we've sort of come from in terms of the series so far. And you may recall in webinar one, we were really focused on improving the quality of financial information for decision-making. So we looked at three main forms of um, financial reporting, a profit and loss, a balance sheet, and a cash flow, and said we really need all three of those to get a full picture of the farm. And some of those involve a few amendments and adjustments and, and uh, putting in market values to get the best and most accurate figures for producing, for making better decisions. So having got that sort of financial information, webinar two moved on to, let's focus on the long-term sort of decisions that need to be made in farming. And it is those long-term decisions that will override or over, over, oversee and be an umbrella over the top of our medium-term decisions. And long-term is probably three years plus, maybe five years plus, depends on the, on the cycles happening in your farm and uh, the rotations you have and that sort of thing. Um, medium term decisions we've defined as somewhere in that one to three year sort of range. So beyond a season, but not sort of in the never, never in the future. Long term decisions were really around um, uh, improving the equity in the farm and reducing the risk. Um, and what we do with our profit that we make each year and putting some priorities in place in terms of maybe reducing debt, maybe investing in the farm, uh, maybe a tax strategy in terms of superannuation or FMDs as you're getting closer to retirement or, or some sort of uh, uh, succession plan uh, and how you're going to work with that. So we, we sort of said the long-term financial goal for most farmers is to improve your wealth in a sustainable manner. So that means uh, looking at the risk and making decisions that impact on the long-term rather than just from year to year. So we looked at a whole bunch of ratios around your financial health and determined uh, how we could look at strengths and weaknesses within those ratios. And some of those ratios were more aligned to the long-term, medium-term and short-term. So what we're looking at in this webinar is the next time horizon down and sort of saying, well, if we've got this long-term goal of improving our wealth um, and we need to make profit to make that happen and then make decisions what we're going to do with that profit, then the medium-term goals are about how we're going to improve our profit performance on the farm. So we're talking profit here, we're not talking, and you'll recall from webinar one, the difference between profit and loss and cash flow. Profit being the revenue you generate, less the costs incurred in generating that revenue. So we're gonna be focusing on profit and loss, and in particular, around the costs involved in profit and loss, uh, primarily so you can make better decisions in that to maximize their profits, so you've got more options of what to do in terms of paying off debt, investing in the farm, those sorts of things. Um, obviously, uh, we then move on to short-term decisions within the season, and a lot of these will be around cash flow and margins and those sorts of things. And our final webinar, we'll be talking about managing risk across all time horizons and some key things that we can do there.
So a bit of an overview and background as to the context of this particular session. So we've got three uh, specific learning outcomes that we're aiming for. And understanding that um, focusing on profit is probably going to be better than focusing on the margins within a season. Now, the margins may lead to profit, um, but we want to make profit over that one to three years and maximize that profit, not just maximize our margin in one year. Because in doing that in one year, we may end up with less profit the next year through the decisions we make. So we want to look in, the, in this medium term and try and get the best profit result we can over that time horizon, which might mean uh, uh, our margins are fairly steady as opposed to high in one year and then not so high in other years because of the decisions we've made. And a typical example may be the decisions you make around sheep and whether you retain them um, for wool or whether you sell them for lambs or all the amount of um, uh, your farm that is devoted to sheep versus cropping and uh, in the short term you might be able to maximize things by making a decision to move in one direction but then that may backfire in the in the next season when prices change when things move so we want to come up with sustainable profit and that means looking at a medium term horizon and balancing some of these costs and revenues over that time to make the best decisions in terms of enterprise mix etc and one of the problems, I guess, in a mixed farm is that the decisions you make around sheep can often be over that one, three, five years, whereas cropping, a lot of your decisions might be to do with this season in particular. So if we've got a mixed farm, then we need to make decisions in that medium term. Yes, uh, this season is important, but we also need to balance that with what does that mean for the next few years as well. And lastly, uh, a key theme that we'll be talking about is if we're going to improve our profit in the medium term, then we need to look at our revenue. We need to look at our variable costs, which drive our margins. And we need to look at our fixed costs or overheads, um, which uh, the farm needs to pay, irrespective of how, how much we actually produce each year in terms of tons of, tons of grain or kilos of wool or kilos of, uh, of meat. So, um, three key things in terms of improving your profit. Make more revenue, uh, have less variable costs, and reduce your overheads. And we'll be looking at some tools and techniques that can help us in those areas. So uh, quick revision from uh, webinar one, and just to highlight some of the ratios we'll be looking at, which are the red ratios. You may remember this slide from uh, webinar uh, two, sorry, not webinar one, last week's uh, webinar. And it's mainly those red ratios around profitability that we'll be looking at and a little bit about efficiency in terms of revenue to asset ratio. Now your assets are including uh, obviously your, your land and your improving our ratio and our usage of land and machinery uh, to generate more revenue are some of the decisions we will make in this medium term, together with those two other red ones around profitability. As farmers are largely price takers, especially when it comes to grain, um, a lot of our focus is going to be on costs because if there's not a lot we can do about the price, then how do we focus on producing more? Uh, so yield and production type uh, decisions. And how do we focus on spending less? Our cost of production type decisions. Um, and largely in the marketplace, um, many of us can't influence the, the price per tonne of grain. Um, and uh, whilst we may have some impact in the price per kilo of meat, based on when we sell things, by and large, we are price takers rather than price makers as farmers. So our decisions are going to be around our yield and production, our enterprise mix, and our cost of production to try and improve our profit in the short term. Let's get into some um, useful, I'm just having a message pop up here in terms of some uh, problems with my connection. So just want to check in again uh, if people can hear me uh, once again, if I could get a yes. If you see my lips moving and uh, okay, somewhat have just been a temporary glitch in my end. Thanks, Christine. Thanks, Adrian. Terrific. 
So my apologies. Uh, Katie's video is sort of not working. So we have had um, uh, odd issues with video and that's largely to do with bandwidth um, uh, at uh, usually at your end. But if the audio is working, that's probably a good thing. And if you've got a copy of the slides. So uh, I will keep going, uh, even though that message sort of threw me a bit there that uh, there was a problem with technology. So let's move on to um, talking about getting some financial information that can help us with these medium term decisions. So I mentioned a focus on costs. So let's start with costs and start to calculate something called of production. And this has to do with the, uh, the total cost of producing a unit of any given commodity. So for meat, it might be per kilo. For wool, it might be per kilo. For, for grain, it may be per ton. So if we can identify how much it's costing us to produce, to be, we can start to calculate a profit uh, per enterprise on our farm. And then we can use that information in terms of decisions around enterprise mix, around decisions to do with what if. What if we were able to reduce this price? What if we were able to get more for what we're actually selling? What if we actually uh, put more hectares into uh, pasture? What impact might that have on the total profit of the farm? So we get our uh, profit per enterprise. Um, and this will vary depending upon your farm and the enterprises that you actually have. Now we're going to focus on production, our cost of production rather than a profit and loss cost. And you may remember that in profit and loss, we actually made adjustments for timing differences between when we sell things and when we get the money for it. And we also made uh, adjustments for uh, changes in what we call our tradable assets, things like the size of our flock. In this calculation, we're going to simplify things by just focusing on what we're producing, not necessarily what we're selling. So we we're going to work out our average cost of production and use that to help us make decisions. So the first step in actually doing that is to take our costs, which are not directly related to either uh, to any specific enterprise and allocate them to those enterprises. Now, in terms of your slides, it, your slides will say, start by allocating uh, overhead expenses to enterprises. And you can see in my slide, I've actually changed that word and put it in blue and put indirect expenses rather than overheads. Now, by and large, they're very similar things, but I just wanted to focus on what I mean by indirect. Indirect means I can't directly associate this expense with any one particular enterprise. So a good example would be management labor. That is, uh, in webinar one, we spoke about allocating a cost into your profit and loss for the time and effort and energy taken to manage your farm. Now, this may not be your drawings. This may be a notional figure of what you would have to pay a farm manager to run your farm. So we want to put that figure in there as a true reflection of the time and effort and energy put in to running the farm because if things aren't going that well, there's a temptation that you may not take that much out in drawings. Um, and really what you're doing is reinvesting in the farm. That is, instead of taking 100 out, maybe you took 50 out and you forego the other 50 to help the farm along. You're reinvesting in the farm, basically, by not taking out your full amount of drawings. If we want to get accurate figures to actually make decisions on, we want to allocate a full value to your time and effort. So we're going to put in an amount there that may be equivalent to uh, what you may need to pay someone to run the farm. And, and it's just a, an estimate. It's not meant to be a, a specific and accurate figure. It, it's just uh, showing us an allocation there. And in this case, we've said 50% of it and the other 50% by definition must be with crops. So that then means um, we move from 100 grand per annum 50% sheep, that means $50,000 is allocated to our sheep and 50,000 to crops. And because that 100 grand is spread between the two, what we're doing in this table is finding a way to allocate them between the two different enterprises. Now, the method we're using is actually your understanding of the farm. 
And in this case, it would be how much time and effort goes into sheep, how much of your time and effort goes into cropping. We're not going to use any scientific method. This is about your intuition, your gut feel, your knowledge of your farm and the time and effort required. Now, some other people, when they do this, might use a, uh, a ratio, uh, you know, the percentage of revenue uh, that comes from sheep and the percentage from crops, and let's allocate it that way. Um, but I think it's more accurate to actually build upon the knowledge you have to actually work out how much should be allocated rather than use some statistical methodology because each farm's different and, um, and who knows better as to the time and effort taken than the person actually doing the work yourself. So that's the basis on which this is happening. This is a, an estimate based on your knowledge of the farm. Okay, and we're going to do that for every single in. So any costs that we haven't already directly allocated to sheep and crops, uh, and by and large, they are your overheads. Um, there are a couple of exceptions there, and I'll explain those when I get there. Uh, depreciation is the next expense, and we haven't spoken about depreciation yet, and we will talk more in detail. Five, uh, when we look at the difference between accounting figures and your own figures. Now, depreciation is the allocation of the purchase price of an asset over its useful life. So if you put in uh, fencing for your sheep and it costs you 50 and that fencing will last you 10 years, then the depreciation would be $5,000 a year. If you buy a header for, uh, and I'm just making figures up because I don't really know, uh, let's say $300,000 and it's going to last you 15 years, then the depreciation simply would be $20,000 a year. It's the allocation of the purchase price of your assets, your plant and equipment, machinery, um, and um, uh, improvements to the land, like fencing, um, over the useful life, how long we think they will last. So um, in this case, we've got $80,000. And the estimate from the owners of this farm says 20% of that, one-fifth, is relevant for sheep. And when you stop and think about it, a lot of our um, plant and equipment and the high cost plant and equipment is related to more the cropping side of things. Um, so that makes sense that there's a lesser allocation in this particular instance to sheep. So we then take 20% um, of 80, which is 16, and then 80% of 80, which is 64. And we allocate the 64 to the crops and the 16 to the sheep. And we go through all the other costs that haven't been allocated to each enterprise or are not easily allocated to each enterprise and we allocate them out. Now, Katie actually emailed me last night with a very good question. Is fuel and oil an overhead or is it a variable cost? And I said, well, generally it's a variable cost because it's going to go up and down with how much you produce, how many hectares you put into certain crops. Uh, uh, might require more use of uh, tractors and more use of uh, headers. Uh, but there's also an element of fuel and oil where you're driving into town and back and uh, doing other things on the farm which are spread between the two different enterprises. So in this case, we're going to call it an indirect cost, something that hasn't yet been allocated between sheep and crops. And in this case, the bulk of our fuel and oil, just with uh, as with our depreciation, is that cropping 85% and 15% to sheep. So we take the 60 and 15% is nine and the balance is cropping. Plant repairs, similar sort of spread. Uh, the estimate is 15% for sheep. Uh, but here's something that uh, is more 100% uh, sheep, uh, water fencing, that sort of thing. So we're gonna allocate the full price of that and cost of that to our sheep. We're going to take our insurance and allocate that based on our understanding of our insurance premium and what it actually covers and allocate 30% to sheep and 70% to crops. And lastly, admin rates, accounting fees, that sort of thing, the general uh, costs of running the farm. And we're going to split that 50-50. So in total, our overheads or indirect costs in this case, um, the things that haven't been spread between the different enterprises on the farm uh, all add up to 360. And based on these allocations, 
and 238,000 for cropping. Now that we have that information, we're in better position to actually build a bit of a profit and loss for each enterprise because we've spread out the indirect costs and allocated them between crops and sheep. Now, I'm going to take a drink of water at this point in time um, and get you guys to ask me any questions about that allocating the indirect costs between the two different, uh, in this case, two different enterprises, sheep and cropping. So if you have any uh, questions, just type them into the chat box now while I take a sip of water. I must have explained that really well. All the audio is gone and no one's hearing me at all, but um, I'm sure that's not the case. Okay, so uh, let's move on to our next um, our next page, and this is probably one of the um, uh, more difficult sort of tables to sort of read and interpret. But we've tried to make it as simple as possible. Um, doing here is calculating the profit and loss on enterprise production. Remember, this is production, not sales. So. However much wool we produced, however many kilos of meat we produced, however many tons of grain we produced, what did it cost us is what we're working out here. Um, so if you look up the top here, I've called it direct costs. Probably in your um, um, uh, slides, it's called variable costs. These are the costs we can directly associate with each enterprise. So shearing, for example, with our sheep or drenching, um, is 100% sheep and we can allocate it there straight away. Um, and with our cropping, maybe it's around uh, the chemicals we're using or if we get a contract harvester in, that's directly associated with cropping. And in this case, we have $200,000 for direct uh, um, costs for our sheep and 325 for our cropping. The line above that is saying that um, how many hectares of arable farmland is used for each enterprise. So we're not including the non-arable. That's just a bonus if your sheep can graze on that because there's nothing else you could do with it sort of thing. So it, it's, a, it's a cost that um, uh, is there no matter what. So we're only looking at your arable land here, the things that have alternative purposes and uses. So in this case, we've got the 200 and the 325. And then based on our previous table, we've allocated the overheads, or in this case, I've called them in blue indirect costs, just to help you explain what, understand what I'm actually referring to. We've, uh, we've taken those two figures from the previous table, 122 for sheep and 238 for cropping and allocated them to the two different enterprises. Now, this next line, line three, and you can see the numbers to identify each uh, row in the table is uh, maybe going to take a little bit of understanding in that we've allocated a cost of land. Now, this is a notional cost. It's not an exact cost. It's not a dollar cost. It is a cost to help us work out the true cost of production. One of the major inputs into farming is obviously the land. And we need to recognize that if we're to produce some management figures that accurately re represent the full cost of using that land. So we're going to use a commercial lease rate. And in this case, for a thousand uh, hectares, we've said 150 grand uh, for cropping and for sheep. It is the opportunity cost of that land. If you didn't use that thousand hectares, could you lease it out to someone for 150? So if you're going to actually use it yourself, consider that $150,000 as a notional expense in working out the full cost of production. Um, and if you can't cover that cost in what you're doing, then maybe you're best just leasing that land out to someone else. So it's, it's a good thing to put in to allow us to understand the full cost of production and make good decisions about the use of our land. So we need to put a cost in to reflect that. Just importantly, understand it's obviously not a dollar cost. It's just a cost we're putting in there to fully reflect the true cost of what we're doing. 
such that we can make better decisions on our enterprise mix and whether we lease out land or lease more land. Um, and what if we changed our costs? What would that actually result in? Add up all the costs for our sheep, we get 472,000 and all the costs for cropping and we get 713. We then divide those total costs by the number of um, hectares. So 472 divided by the thousand and 713 divided by the thousand and we get a cost of production per hectare. $472 per hectare for sheep, 713. And there's the formula at the side there. You can see the formula for the total cost of production, one plus two plus three. And then we take four and divide it by the number of hectares or arable hectares. Now, let's start to work out the cost of production. And we're going to do it on the basis of uh, that unit production, that uh, kilogram, that um, a ton of grain or kilogram of wool. So uh, the first line says, well, how much have we produced um, over uh, the season? So in, uh, in this case, we're taking an average over the last three years, and it's actually 90,000 kilograms of lamb. So what we're actually using here uh, is the carcass weight at weaning. And carcass weight being about 45% of the live weight. And it's important we align that kilograms of production to the variable costs up here, the 200,000 that helped us produce that. And we want to do this every year in terms of at the same time. We don't want to wait until the, the sheep are bigger or a different stage or whether they're smaller. Otherwise, this will not provide consistent results in terms of our cost of production. So um, I'm going to call on Perry, if anyone's got any questions about that. So have a think about uh, what that figure actually represents, because it's a bit easier to understand, I guess, in terms of the tons of grain produced. We're talking about the kilograms of meat produced, and we've drawn a line and made an assumption that we're doing this at weaning and then taking the kilograms, multiplying by 45% uh, of the live weight to get a carcass weight. Because what we want to align it to is the price at the abattoir and the price paid per carcass uh, rather than live weight. So if we uh, have produced 90,000 kilograms of lamb and 2,800 tonnes of grain, then what we do is we take four, the total cost of production, 472 for our sheep, we divide it by 90 and we get an average cost of production of $5.24. And on a similar basis for our cropping, we get $255 a tonne. If the price per kilogram for that carcass is $4.50 and it's costing us $5.24, then we take the $4.50 and we multiply by the 90,000 kilograms, our total value is $405,000 of production. So this isn't sales, this is what we've produced. The 90,000 multiplied by our three year average price of $4.50. That means 405,000. So you can see that that actually means uh, when it comes to sheep, we've made a loss. Now, when it comes to lamb, sorry, we've made a loss because our cost of production for sheep was 472, but the value of that production was 405. Whereas uh, with our uh, cropping, with the value of production using $280 a tonne was 784, but the cost of production was 713, so we've actually made 71,000. Um, and we see that $71,000 figure down the bottom there. Um, so this isn't looking too good in that we've made a, um, a loss there in terms of 67,000. Uh, just ignore that 280, that's a bit of a typo. That should be um, $71,000. So we've made a loss of 67, um, but we do have uh, some wool to sell, and we've got 25,000 kilograms of wool. The next line, how much would we need to get for that wool to cover the $67,000 loss we've made so far in our sheep enterprise? 
And if we take the $67,000 and we divide by the 25,000, which is minus nine divided by 10, um, or nine divided by 10, it was 68. And then we see that the actual price we're using over the last three year average is $10 a kilogram for greasy wool. So obviously we're making a profit. 10 times the 25,000 kilograms is 250,000. 250,000 minus the 67, a loss in inverted commas on lambs, means the sheep enterprise has actually produced $183,000 profit using these figures. So um, cropping has come in at 71, whilst if we just considered our lambs, we've made a loss of 67, but we need to look at and we've actually made a profit of 183. And in fact, if wool was only $2.68, we would have broken even with our sheep. So you can start to see we're starting to get some figures that help us make decisions. You know, what price do we think wool will be in the future? Is it going to be more than $2.68? How much more? $10. But you might say, well, next season, I might think it's only $8. Well, then you can start to calculate what you anticipate in terms of uh, profit. You can start to do some what if analysis. Uh, what if I could reduce my de direct costs or indirect costs? What if I could improve my production uh, and produce more kilos uh, or more tons? Um, what impact would that actually have? So let me just check my notes here in terms of um, explaining that table and hopefully I've explained it reasonably well. Um, a couple of key things, a notion of cost of land to the value of the land we're actually using. Um, and you can see in our cost of production, we're not putting in something like interest because typically we would be borrowing money to either buy plant or buy land or invest in um, assets on the farm. Um, we've covered the assets in the depreciation when we allocated that in our indirect costs. We've covered the cost of land with line three, row three. So we don't want to actually put in uh, interest and finance costs because they're already technically covered uh, with these land al allocation and depreciation costs we've put into our figures. So once again, I'm going to stop there because that's a pretty key sort of table to understand the cost of production and the potential profit on production. We say potential because we haven't actually put sales in there. We've just put a value on what we've produced and there might be timing differences or there might be differences in uh, tradable assets, your flock size, your grain holdings, those sorts of things to actually calculate your profit. So we're working out here your cost of production and profit on enterprise production. So I'll give people a chance to ask any questions they may have. And if they're any, if they're very technical, I'll get Perry on stage um, so he can answer them. But if you're pretty comfortable with the numbers and figures, and I think the comments at the side showing you where they come from uh, should help in terms of understanding this. This is one of our key homework activities for your farm is to try and calculate your costs of production. And we give you a blank table like this. So this is a pretty key slide to be able to go back to. Any questions? Not seeing anyone typing, so looks like Perry, you might have got out of that one easily, but uh, there are some more slides down the track which may require your expert advice. So just a quick slide here to sort of show how the cost of production and the profit on enterprise production relates back to profit and loss. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this one, but I'm just showing you the difference uh, between the calculation we've just done, working out the profit on enterprise production and now we're going to convert it to actually wool sales um, so um, and lamb sales. Um, so you can see some, uh, some figures in here in terms of what we actually sold rather than what we potentially produced. We've still got the same uh, cost of production, the 472, but in this case, there's an adjustment for a change in the size of the flock. And obviously we've got to add back the land cost because that was a notional cost. That was a made up cost to reflect the true value of the land we're actually using. It's not a financial cost. We're not paying anyone 
for that land. Um, but we're putting it in there so we get more accurate figures so we can make better decisions. Uh, so we end up with an earnings before interest and tax with our sheep at 229. And we do a similar thing with our crop. And once again, we add back the land that we allocated to, cro to crop the land cost. So we get 221 there. We add the 221 and the 229, we get 450. And now we take off the finance costs, okay? Um, because we've added those land costs back, finance is a, is a cost that we need to consider. We get 250, less our tax giving us 175. So that's not the same. If you remember the previous slide, we had um, you know 183 and 71, 254, uh, and we're getting 175 here. The difference being uh, finance costs, these land costs, and the movement in our flock size. So the uh, accounting profit and loss would be more this figure down here based on what we've actually sold rather than what we produced. So hopefully that distinction is reasonably clear to people. Um, the key one is uh, we want to use this cost of production to help us make decisions, but understand how it fits in with our profit and loss. Just one more slide and I'll ask for any further questions um, in terms of, uh, well, the other thing we haven't considered here, sorry, is um, drawings. And I know uh, drawings was asked about in webinar one um, in terms of where are they reflected. And you may remember that in the overheads, we had that 100,000 management labor. And that was that uh, entry to reflect the the cost and the time and the effort spent managing the farm. So that's essentially our drawings. And that's included in the uh, indirect costs we allocated to sheep. So it's included in our cost production for sheep. Remember it was a 50-50 allocation. So there's 50 grand in there. Uh, and there's also 50 grand in our crops crop uh, cost of production. Um, so there's 100 grand actually in there. Uh, we could take that 100 grand out and actually put the drawings further down here, but uh, we've already allocated it. It's already in there. Um, so, it so one more slide and uh, we'll have a bit of a break and you can stretch your legs and maybe think of uh, some other questions to ask myself and or uh, Perry, who's on the line. Um, and this is going beyond the numbers and figures in terms of these medium term decisions. These are financial uh, considerations we need to take into account in terms of uh, making enterprise mix type decisions. How much do we put into cropping? How much into, into sheep? And it's very difficult to put these into numbers, dollars and cents, but it's important to consider them as qualitative factors in making financial decisions. So qualitative as opposed to quantitative. So stuff we can't put into numbers and figures. And the first one is when you look at your enterprise mix, then you find that um, uh, there is a benefit in terms of having a mix of sheep and cropping because it diversifies your income. You're not putting all your eggs into one basket. You're not 100% wheat. Uh, and then the wheat price crashes or 100% sheep and the wool price crashes. Uh, you're spreading the risk by diversifying your income. Um, when we look at risk in webinar five, what we'll see is some studies have shown a negative correlation between um, wool and, uh, and meat, sheep meat and grain prices. What does that mean? It means over time, when one is up, the other's slightly down, and the, when the other one's uh, up, it, the first one's slightly down. By evening out the two, you're managing some of the risk of uh, price fluctuations. By having a diversity of income through that negative correlation between um, wheat and uh, sheep. The second one to consider is uh, the value of pasture and sheep in terms of uh, weed control over that medium term, you know, a rotation, uh, one to three years. If we were just looking at the one year, then we may not be considering the benefit of uh, having pasture and sheep in our rotation. It also 
need less chemicals when the weeds are controlled better and we need less fertilizer when the soil's healthier. And I guess from my limited knowledge of farming, um, pasture crops or, or uh, lupins, feed crops, put nitrogen back into the soil, uh, which can then lessen your fertilizer bills um, for uh, future years of cropping. Um, and an improvement in yields uh, through mixed farming. And in fact, a lot of research uh, and benchmarking, and we have s highlighted some of the issues around benchmarking and the need to maybe benchmark yourself, but in terms of top farmers having at least sheep as opposed to 100% in cropping. Uh, in effect, the cropping profit is artificially in inverted commas being propped up through that mixed farming and having sheep in your rotation and having pasture crops in your rotation. We aren't able to put a figure on these sorts of things but they are true considerations in terms of thinking of your enterprise mix. So whilst we're going to focus on some numbers and we've given you some numbers in terms of the cost of production to start to make medium term decisions about your mix, uh, also think about some of these more uh, qualitative sort of concerns that you need to take on board around risk, around the cost of chemicals, around the cost of fertilizer, around uh, potential benefits in terms of yield. So why don't, uh, why don't we take a break there? Um, we've been going 45 minutes or so. And as we take a break, just five minutes, we'll get um, back underway at 9.50. Um, have a think about any questions because we have covered some um, pretty important financial calculations um, and some of them may require a bit more explanation. So if that's required, by all means, type those questions in and we'll deal with them when we come back from a break at 9.50. So welcome back for those that have uh, rejoined us and um, good question from Katie. Most of our lambs go as stores, price per head. How do I get a figure for kilograms or can I just do it as average price per head? Look, my, my immediate response to that, and you can see that I've, um, I've said to Perry whether he wants to um, come on board, um, Perry's typing. And rather than me give a response, I might wait for Perry's uh, response. I, I'm just thinking that it's about consistency. It's about um, putting a cost per production. So if that's how you get paid per head, then you should be considering maybe instead of doing it per kilo, doing it per head. So let's see what uh, Perry actually says in his typed response. Anyone else have any other questions? Now would be a good time to um, type them in as we move into the second half of the webinar around looking at profit drivers and maybe decisions we can make around those profit drivers. Uh, must be a long response. Perry's typing a bit. Looks like he's hit enter. You could estimate the live weight and this is Perry's response for those and may can't, maybe can't see the question or response, you could estimate the live weight and use 45% as the carcass weight or do it on per head basis as Doug has suggested. Oh, well, maybe I wasn't too, too wide of the mark. Um, the key thing in terms of cost production is we're trying to work out a cost per unit uh, of production. And as with our grain, it's tons, with a wool, wool it's kilograms. And I guess with sheep, it could be kilograms or it could be per head. Um, Similarly, um, um, I imagine then um, that might have issues as you then go and add the wool onto that being per kilogram and, and then working out a total from there. So um, hopefully that answers your question, Katie. If you could just give us a, a why if you're happy or if you have a further point of clarification. No, Katie's happy, so that's good. Fantastic. So let's, uh, let's move on to uh, the balance of our slides. Uh, and this next slide comes from some research by um, uh, an organisation over in South Australia. I think it's the Grain Research Development Corporation, GRDC, which some of our references um, use that site. Um, and this was across 300 different farms. And they sort of said, well, what drives the profit on the farm? And the first one was around margin optimization. So margin being the variable costs away from your revenue and you're left with a gross margin. 
So the, the less chemicals you can use and the higher yield you can get use, the, the less cost, sorry, of your chemicals and the higher yield, or in terms of sheep, in terms of reducing those variable costs, but maximizing the revenue you get out of it is going to improve your margins. We're going to look at that quite closely in webinar four, which, are, which has to do with decisions you make in the short term, in the season, to optimize your margin. Second thing the research said is risk management. That's going to be a topic for our webinar five, managing risk, not taking too much risk, and then it blows up and backfires on you. Aligning your risk to your level and acceptance of risk uh, and not going too far. People and management of the farm, and that's really um, some of the other um, uh, learning um, forums within the DPIRD um, cover much of that. Uh, there's a five-day face-to-face program, um, plan, prosper, profit, I think it is, triple P. Perry will correct me on that one. Uh, and planning for profit, uh, a one-day session as well. The one we're going to focus on is develop a low-cost business model. And we're going to uh, look at what that means in terms of your farm. What is a low cost business model? So they were the four key drivers of profit. And if we look at a low cost business model or we apply some of those things, then we get a bit of a formula here in terms of what drives profit in sheep, the price times how much you've produced minus those direct and indirect costs equals your profit. So if we can maximize our profit, the price we get, for example, uh, through the timing of our sales, um, that could be one step we take. Obviously, maximizing production, um, yield, uh, quickly we can get our sheep to grow to the right size so that we can sell them. Uh, and we'll look at some KPIs that uh, can help you monitor that in a minute. And then optimizing our costs. And when it comes to sheep, one of our main costs is obviously going to be around labor. Notice that we actually talk about optimizing costs. Uh, we don't talk about uh, uh, minimizing. Minimizing suggests get them as low as possible, but they may have a negative impact on your production. So we want to optimize them. We, have, we want the best level of cost for the balance it gives us in terms of what we're actually producing. So our uh, low cost business model is largely around the figures we've generated in our cost of production calculations. Um, so let's, let's take that a step further and, um, and look at the, the profit and loss in a farm and those cost of production type figures and say, well, what does this mean in terms of some of the decisions we can actually make? So we can either increase our revenue, reduce our variable or direct costs, or reduce our overheads or indirect costs. Three key steps in terms of being more profitable. So we've got more money to invest in the farm to grow our wealth sustainably in the long term. See how the medium term goals are linking into those longer term goals. So three key steps. Let's look at uh, an example. And um, I do a bit of work in the retailing rule of thumb in retailing that is called the 615 rule. And what I've done is applied it to a farm. And what it says is, imagine if we could increase our revenue by 6%. What if we could reduce our variable costs by of revenue and our overheads by 5%? What impact would that have on our profit? And a lot of people go, well, 6%, 1%, 5%, you know, it'll probably have a 12% or so impact. But let's have a look at the figures there. If our revenue or sales was a million dollars and we increased it by 6%, we've gone up to a million and 60. If our variable costs, all the cropping costs and the, and the sheep costs that are directly associated with each enterprise, if they were 60% of our revenue, then that would give us a gross profit of 400. But if we could improve them just by 1% and get them down to 59% of revenue rather than 60%, 59%, uh, let me just show you with the pointer, 59% of a million and 60 is 435. So it's still more than the 400 because you've produced more, but it's a more efficient. If we could get 
more um, more revenue. So I just had a temporary sort of outage my end. Hopefully everything's okay your end. So we've got 435. That then means that we'll end up with a, um, oh, we take our overhead, sorry. And if we could reduce them by 5%, from 300 to 285. Just 5% reduction somehow. Work out a way to reduce them 5%. In our current situation, we've got 400, less 300. We've got a net, net profit of 100. In this revised situation, when we've applied the 615 rule, we've actually ended up with 150,000 in profit. We've ended up with a 50% 50, 50 increase in profit by doing three things. We're focusing on improving our revenue, reducing our variable costs, and reducing our overheads. And each one of those is manageable. It's not as if we're saying we want a 50% increase in revenue or a 30% reduction in variable costs or a 20% um, less overheads. Five. Now for your farm, it might be four, two, three. Um, you know your costs better than me and what the potential is in terms of improving revenue, reducing variable costs and reducing overheads. We need to um, think about the risks involved in doing this. But in essence, uh, by focusing on improving our profit from a revenue, a variable costs and an overhead perspective, we've got a three pronged approach to improvement. We haven't put all our eggs in one basket. And that way, if we achieve the revenue improvement, but not the variable costs, and we achieve the overheads, we're still gonna be a lot better off. So if we only achieve two of the three, we're gonna be a lot better off than just focusing on one. Balanced approach and a, um, a multiple attack on improving our profit, not just saying we will get more revenue. So if we were to put that into a slide, uh, the three key things, what are you gonna to do to increase revenue? Maybe in your case, not by six, maybe it's five, maybe it's seven. You think there's more potential there. Look at some of the benchmarks, look at your past performance and see what your potential is. Think about what capacity there is to save in overheads. Look at your overheads, um, what potential is there? Think about the sorts of things you can do. And in the coming slides, we're gonna identify some options for you. Some may be relevant to you, some not so relevant. Uh, it's up to you to decide which is the most likely. Uh, and in webinar four, we're gonna focus on how to reduce your variable costs by 1%. So the remainder of the slides are really around those first two items there. What are the sorts of things you can do to improve in revenue? And uh, what are the sorts of things we can do to reduce our overheads? Any questions at this stage in terms of the profit drivers? And then identifying, in your case, it might be seven, three, zero. Um, I don't think I can improve my variable costs, but I can improve my overheads by three. And I think I can improve my um, revenue by seven or I know lots of my variable costs are going up in terms of their price. So if I can keep them at zero, then I've actually made some savings because uh, I'm using less of them and I've covered that price rise. So uh, they're the key focuses in terms of mathematically and financially getting a better profit. And if you can do all three of those, it won't be a cumulative thing. It will be an exponential improvement in your profit. Uh, so, Let's look at some things we could do to maybe improve revenue. And we're gonna focus on sheep revenue here. Um, and Perry has provided me with some um, really good pointers in terms of things you need to monitor on a regular basis. And better, sorry, gone too far there. So, what we're focusing on here is the availability of information to improve your revenue. If we are price takers largely in terms of when we go to market, um, then it stands to reason an improvement in revenue is coming back to an improvement in production. And these are the sorts of key performance marks, figures, statistics, 
that would be relevant and appropriate in terms of uh, monitoring to improve your production when it comes to sheep. This is um, more detail on each one of these is provided in your notes for this session. There's a little description and a little rationale as to why this can help you. And they're split into um, four headings there in terms something that is overall in terms of uh, you should be monitoring your, uh, your stocking rate, your dry sheep equivalent to winter grazed hectares. Um, and then there's four headings in terms of know the potential and what you've lost. Look at the scanning rate, the marking rate, the weaning rate and your losses. And keep track record of those and make decisions to improve those. Will improve your production. Your wool yield and quality. The average cut per ewe, per weather. The wool cut um, winter grazed hectares and average microns. I guess microns is determining uh, some of the, the price and premium pricing, etc. Then we look at lamb yield and efficiency, the average sale weight. Um, and I guess we've got live weight and we've got carcass weight and we've got the average age at sale and the quicker we can get them to, um, to the, the sale date, the uh, better off we're going to be. And then we've got uh, the ones in blue are highlighted as, uh, as uh, minimum requirements, if you like, important measures. Uh, lambs produced per winter grazed hectare, lambs sold winter grazed hectare, and the growth rate to sale date, grams per head per day. So if you can improve those, you're going to improve your production, which will improve your revenue. And then lastly, prices, average wool prices, average sale price, uh, average sale value ahead, as Katie's question was sort of talking about versus live weight and carcass weight, etc. So what we're talking about here is improving your production by getting good information and then making decisions to improve any one of these to improve how much you have to sell. And if you improve your production, but your overhead remain the same, then on a per unit basis, they're going to be less per unit. If, if my overheads are $100,000 and I can produce um, 100,000 kilos rather than 90,000 kilos, then it makes sense that on a per unit basis, my overheads are now less because I produce more. That's what we call economies of scale. So the higher the scale, um, the higher the, the production, the better your economies of scale, the lower your unit cost for production. So some really good um, um, measures there to keep an eye on. The blue ones are the sort of must do's and the other ones are maybe nice to do. Uh, so be interested to reflect upon which ones you actually keep an eye on. Now, we mentioned um, uh, an increase in revenue. What about uh, what can we do to reduce the heads? And we're going to look at a, a, a range of different options here, about 10 different options. We mentioned that wages is a, a key overhead, especially to sheep. So um, we're looking at permanent wages and maybe setting productivity targets for those, wage, for those uh, uh, employees uh, in terms of how much value you, they're adding to the farm. And can I put some measures and monitor that rather than allowing a, a degree of um, under usage of that labor, if you like. We could look at things like work cover and making sure we implement safe work practices to, to lessen the risk of a claim, which might then increase our premiums down the track. So looking at OH&S and making sure we have good uh, measures in place. Um, we're going to talk about banking and finance in webinar five, but I recommend this for banking as well as insurance. From time to time, stop and review your provider and the amount of insurance you actually have. Um, some insurers, uh, <laughs> their, their premiums drift up over the years because they call it the lazy premium, um, because people are too lazy to check whether there's a better deal on the go. Um, and in that laziness, it, it um, Repairs and maintenance, have a good uh, schedule and keep to that schedule. Don't skip things and then re run the risk of a major breakdown down the track. Um, monitor for waste and leaks in your utilities. Um, consider libraries and online options in terms of subscription. 
In general, communication, how much we communicate and how well we communicate to lessen our overhead costs and avoid confusion and inefficiencies that result from people misunderstanding things. Maybe you want to consider training and look at uh, some excellent options in terms of free webinars like this one. Um, but uh, interesting to hear some people not attending today are on sort of options in terms of free seminars, etc. Um, regular maintenance to, to optimize the use of fuel and oil. And indeed, in terms of things like accounting fees and professional fees in general, do as much as you can yourself. Have your books in good order so that it takes less time for your accountant or your farm advisor to provide that advice and support. So a few key things that you might want to consider in the medium term about reducing your overheads to reduce your costs, <clears throat> excuse me, the costs of production. Now we did talk a little bit about labour there in terms of permanent wages and setting productivity targets. So I just want to zero in a bit on that uh, labour and sort of, in my view, I think there's uh, three different types of tasks that people do. Tasks are unavoidable. So if you're employing labour in the farm or indeed if it's your own labour in terms of maximising your time and getting the most out of it, there's some things that you just need to do. Um, and it's about optimising the time you, you do that. Administrative uh, issues. So are you using your software to its full advantage? Any meetings you have, do they, do they draw on? Are the right people actually there? Are they short, sharp, to the point? And we had some follow-up uh, um, on what was said at the meeting so that everyone was clear on the meeting. Um, cleaning up for the next task. Uh, it, it's, it's unavoidable, but uh, how can we do it most efficiently? Uh, and maintenance falls into that category as well. What other tasks do, do people do? Uh, I think we want to focus on the desirable tasks. So we want to cut some time out of these uh, unavoidable tasks, still get the outcome we're looking for, but do it more quickly and more efficiently so that we can spend time measuring and monitoring. Some of those KPIs that we just looked at for your sheep, you may not keep those sort of figures to keep them, but you can make better decisions when you have that sort of information. So uh, focus on these desirable tasks and move away from the, the tasks that aren't adding as much value. Uh, supervision and delegation, being able to develop the people on your farm such that they can do more and more pressure off um, the senior people in the farm so that they can spend their time on more important stuff. So invest time supervising and delegating and planning and attending training. Try and get the most out of that and don't put it off because, oh well, um, in this course it won't affect the yield this year. But you know what, in the medium term it may do and it may make a big difference. Oh, I won't bother planning it, I'll just worry about it when it happens. Uh, and then it happens and you waste a lot of time worrying and, and running around and trying to sort things out. Whereas if you had a plan on place, it may have lessened the chance of something bad happening. Um, so invest some time in these things. Focus on the desirable tasks. And there's definitely some uh, unnecessary tasks you want to eradicate, get rid of. Lessen the mistakes. Downtime, waiting for things. Double handling. Excess capacity, you've got um, uh, people standing around maybe not doing anything or not uh, optimising their time and they're on a go slow sort of thing. And you can use technology maybe, maybe rather than uh, using too much labour. So some general thoughts around uh, labour productivity and some of the key um, focuses to try and get the best out of your um, time and effort and energy and cost that you're spending on labour. We, we mentioned there on the, uh, at the bottom of the slide there, the use of technology. So let's just focus in on a bit of plant and equipment and technology and look at some um, technology that you could use that could help you be more productive. 
Now, once again, I don't propose to be an expert on this, and there is a, a website reference in our reference slide at the end of the pack that gives you more information on these sorts of things. But typically when we think of technology and machinery, we might first go to our cropping, um, but if we stopped and looked at our cost of production and we saw the impact that some of this technology could have, is the marginal benefits greater than the marginal costs. Think back to webinar two, where we we're talking about the pros and cons and, and the incremental revenue that it could help generate versus the incremental costs. Some of these might be quite low cost, but generate a reasonable return. Some of them might be higher cost, but generate an even better return. So stop and think about the benefits of these uh, pieces of technology, uh, especially around your sheep and how they may help you uh, improve your production, lessen errors, uh, save money, such that you can uh, justify the expenditure through the... Remember in webinar two, we use something called a payback period. What is the cost? You know, $10,000, but it's going to save me $20,000 a year, payback period six months. Wow, that seems like a pretty good investment. So have a consideration about uh, technology across the farm not just in the cropping area. Uh, and as I said, there is a reference to consider when we get to that page. Um, as you're using machinery, um, think about some of these sorts of decisions to make sure that you are getting the best uh, value from it and minimizing your costs. Should I be doing it or a contractor? Should I buy new equipment or secondhand? Maybe I can share machinery with others, with neighbors, etc. Maybe I could lease more land or hire addition uh, for more hours. Uh, maybe it's about the logistics and efficiency or even um, the growers. So a range of different considerations you think about um, in terms of using machinery more efficiently to improve your overhead costs. So what we've done so far in this webinar is we've uh, started to look at medium term decisions and said, look, it's pretty important to align those medium term decisions uh, to the long term goals that you've actually set. If we want more profit to be able to give us more options in terms of investing in the farm, reducing debt, preparing for retirement, all the things we spoke about in webinar two, then we need to make decisions over the next uh, three years or so that are going to optimize and maximize our profit. We started by saying to do this, we need some good information and cost of production is going to information. So we've got to allocate our indirect slash overhead expenses, those expenses that are not directly associated specifically with an enterprise. And we've got to allocate them between enterprises such that we can come up with a cost of production for the enterprise. Remember, this is about production, not about sales. And we've simplified it by taking out any timing issues or indeed any um, fluctuations in uh, things like flock sizes, that sort of. So with that information, we can then work out a cost of production. We can compare that to what we think we're going to get in terms of uh, sales and revenue from that cost of production per kilo, per tonne, per whatever. And then we can work out our potential profit based on those sort of estimates. And that allows us to make decisions about our enterprise mix. And it also allows us to make what if type decisions. What if we could improve this or change that? We also need to consider all those qualitative things in the enterprise mix. We need to think about the, the value of having sheep in our rotation and the impact on uh, diversifying our risk in terms of fertilizer, chemicals, and improving improvement of yield. Then we start to make what if decisions. We go, what if we could improve our revenue by, in this case, we said 6%. Maybe in your case, it's a bit different. What if we could um, improve our variable costs, which we'll talk about in the next webinar, or improve our overheads, which we spoke about in this webinar? And indeed, if we could do all three of those, then that would be a reasonable approach to improving our profit. So let me just go back to the slides. So that's a bit of a summary of what we've actually covered. And I've just summarized that by looking at the learning outcomes again. 
We're going to use profit rather than margins for the decisions that span a season. And a lot of the decisions you make about sheep span seasons. So if you're making decisions about the whole of your farm, sheep and crops, you need to make decisions that are going to be best in the next three or so years, not just this year. If you want to optimize your profit to generate wealth in the long term. And that means managing your revenue, managing your margins and managing your overheads. So I'm going to take a bit of a breather there because we've got to the end of our slides there, a little bit sort of earlier than uh, I thought. I thought we'd go right through to 10.30, but it's only 10.20. So we have plenty of time if people have any questions. Um, in terms of the homework activity, what we do is we take you through a template to calculate your own costs of production. Having done that, we then say, well, given all the options we've spoken about and given your longer term goals, um, how much would you like in terms of uh, an improvement in profit? What do you think is viable and feasible? How much do you think you could improve your revenue by and or reduce your overheads by? So set some targets for that. And my targets were the 615. Yours might be slightly different. Having set those targets, what are you going to do to actually make them happen? And you might pick up on some of the options we've given you in some of the slides here. Remember, we'll be talking about variable R4. So primarily the homework is around revenue and overheads, uh, things around your labour, your machinery usage, your other general sort of overheads as well. So that's the homework activity. Thanks very much, guys. Um, have a good week. Have a great Easter. Have a safe Easter if you're driving anywhere.